Hello, welcome to the Tuesday, February 21st, 2017 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Scottsdale, Arizona. At the end of yesterday's podcast, I talked about an XML external entity attack and how it can be used to send email via FTP. I also stated that Postfix doesn't usually accept a disconnection. Well, not quite right. Postfix actually by default only blocks connections via HTTP relays, so it does block some of the standard HTTP verbs like get and post and connect. It doesn't do anything for these FTP based attacks. So today I published a little diary that does show you how to extend Postfix. It's pretty easy. There is an SMTPD forbidden commands setting that you can use to essentially just list whatever commands you would like to block. And if you add user and password, to that, then you will block these FTP relay attacks as well as HTTP relay attacks. User and pass is not used, as far as I know, as part of standard SMTP. In order to authenticate with SMTP, you would use the auth command, which of course is still available in this configuration. And then we got two car hacking related stories. The first one comes from Kaspersky. Kaspersky looked at various apps that car makers are offering their users to remote control cars. Typically, you're able to lock and unlock the car, sometimes even start the car, or use geolocation features in order to figure out where your car is currently at. Now, all of the apps that Kaspersky looked at had some very basic security shortcomings. For example, they didn't protect the app window from overlay, so a malicious application could pretend to be part of the car application. They also don't check if the phone is rooted, and they don't check the integrity of the app, so a malicious software could alter the app after it's being downloaded. Overall, what this comes down to is that these apps are only as secure as the phone that you run them on. If your phone is compromised, then of course this app is compromised as well. In addition, some of these apps, but not all of them, are storing credentials in clear text on the phone. The second story comes from IBM's X-Force and deals again with apps that you're using to remote control your car and that cars have a hard time forgetting prior owners. Apparently, this one researcher was able to still track his car years after he sold it. And the problem here is that, yes, it's pretty easy to add new apps and new phones as authorized phones to the car, but there is no real good way to sort of reset the car and erase all all of these stored credentials within the car. So old applications remain connected to the car even though uh, the car changed owners and these old owners still have full access to the car. And the Xen Hypervisor project is currently discussing to publish less vulnerability disclosures or security advisories than they used to. Essentially what they're trying to do is no longer publish security advisories for what they consider minor flaws that don't really have a security impact. As an example, they mention a flaw that would allow a user of a virtual machine to launch a denial of service against this machine itself, which is somewhat understandable because pretty much on any Unix system, a user having an account on the system can cause significant performance issue to that system. The other uh, criteria they are considering is that they will only publish a security advisory if there's an exploit available for this particular vulnerability. That of course tends to be a little bit more tricky because exploits may not necessarily be publicly available but may very well exist. They do invite comments uh, to these changes. So if you are a user of Xen, if you do have uh, some stake here in this game, then please submit your comment. Overall, my opinion is that security advisories are important if you are trying to prioritize patches and it's good to have some basic understanding on how likely it is that a particular vulnerability will be exploited. 
And talking about the impact of vulnerabilities, Andrew Ludwig, the director of Android security for Google, gave a talk at RSA discussing the impact of some of the high visibility vulnerabilities that we had in Android, like stage fright. Now, most Android devices were vulnerable at some point uh, to any of these flaws, stage fright being sort of the most commonly known one. But according to Andrew, there is not a single incident that can be traced back to this stage fright vulnerability. The data comes from Google's Verify app, which monitors Google or Android devices that are connected to the Google Play Store. So it does not cover devices that are not connected to the Google Play Store, like devices in China or Amazon's Android devices. In general, it may just be easier for attackers to get the victim to download a malicious app than trying to create an exploit, which has become quite difficult for most mobile devices, given all the protections built in to modern mobile operating systems. Well, and that's it for today. So thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.